This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual or anyone or anything. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to tell you about an amazing company. Endeavor AV has over 40 years combined experience in sound, lighting, video and staging services. They cover all of your audiovisual needs, from virtual events, weddings, big screen hire, hybrid events and more, and they follow all of the COVID-19 protocols. No job is too big or too small for this fantastic company. For more information on them, I will post links with their contact information in the show notes. Let them know that Decoding Cult sent you for a discount. Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, and I shall give thee a crown of life. You ready to die for Christ? I think so. Are you ready to kill for him? Another weak Christian! All of you weak! Weak, and it is killing me! To know the price you will pay if you do not follow me. Philippians 1, I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Will you follow me? Yes. Will you follow me? Yes. This is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host, Paul Z. You are listening to The Branch Davidians, Part 5. In this episode, we will be looking at the events that led up to a great tragedy. In 1990, Iraq started accusing Kuwait of stealing their petroleum. This led to an invasion by Iraq on 2 August 1990 to the state of Kuwait, headed by Saddam Hussein. The United Nations brought economic sanctions against Iraq two days later and mandated that they had until the 15th of January 1991 to withdraw from the state, but they refused. This led to a military intervention by coalition forces led by the U.S., which was authorized by the United Nations. On 17 January 1991, they began with aerial and naval bombing, and this was followed up by ground forces on 24 February 1991. The countries which formed the coalition were Australia, Argentina, Canada, France, Italy, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. Subsequent to this, stories had started to emerge on how heads of states were referring to a new world order, where they proposed one universal governing body over all of the world. This was not the first or even the last time that this proposal would come up, but it did not sit well with many people, and they were afraid that this kind of global oversight may infringe on some of their basic human rights. This led to people becoming survivalists, which, according to Oxford, is, quote, a person who tries to ensure their own survival or that of their social or national group, end quote. These reports made an impression on David Koresh, and this, along with other allegations, would turn the followers into a more militant group. The other allegation was that after Mark Bro had left the group and was safely away from David in Australia, he contacted the Israeli consulate in Australia, warning them about the dangers of David and his followers. 
It is my opinion that these two events may have led David to announce that the end of days were no longer going to be in Israel, but would be right there in Texas. They nicknamed Mount Carmel Ranch Apocalypse. David further stated that the United States was Babylon and that the final showdown between good, them, and evil, law enforcement, would happen right there at the compound. In 1991, he tasked the followers to build a main communal church, complete with chapel, kitchen, cafeteria, male and female quarters and bathrooms, a lookout tower and a storm shelter, which was basically an old school bus which they had buried underground, and which could be accessed through a trapdoor at the end of the passage in the men's quarters. There was also a reinforced structure on the grounds, which they built the building around, and this would be used for storage and as a cold room. There were even plans to build a swimming pool in the back and a firing range. Oh, and David's bedroom? Well, that was located next to the women's quarters. People who lived at the compound called it the hotel. David tasked his followers to systematically break down all of the cottages on the compound and recycle the lumber to build their new communal building. Everyone pitched in. The men would tackle the harder jobs and the women would help by removing rubble and transporting recycled goods from the cottages to where the main building was being built. David even pitched in and put his construction and carpentry skills to work. As you recall, David had stated that he was the lamb who would break the seven seals, but his emphasis became more focused on the fifth seal. Revelation 6, 9-11 says, quote, Then the lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty Lord, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? Each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to rest a little while longer, until the complete number of their fellow servants and fellow Christians had been killed as they had been. End quote. So basically, he was teaching them that they were those Christians who would be killed for their beliefs before the end of times would come. David also started studying armament which, according to the dictionary, is, quote, the process of equipping military forces for war, end quote. His sermons were even more militant, where he was now more often than not preaching that his followers were going to fall by fire and that they would be subject to persecution and martyrdom. Many followers, including the children, would receive weapons training. One ex-follower, who was a child at the time, described how David had made her shoot her favorite doll as target practice. He also wrote songs that all of his followers needed to learn, as they were going to sing it when they were dying in battle. Along with arms, they also started stockpiling dried food and ready-to-eat meals like those used by the military. It was also around this time where another key follower would be brought into the fold. David Thibodeau was born in Maine and was raised by his mother and grandmothers. For the sake of not confusing David Koresh and David Thibodeau, I will refer to the latter by his surname. Thibodeau was teased at school because of his weight and took solace by playing the drums. After he matriculated, he worked to save money and then enrolled at a music school in Los Angeles. He also started to play in a band but wasn't all that happy with his fellow bandmates, as they didn't take it as seriously as he did. One day, in 1989, while in a guitar shop, he ran into Steve Schneider and David Koresh. He described Steve as very businesslike, and David as more casual but quiet. Steve had asked Thibodeau to play drums for them, and he did. When Steve handed him a business card for Messiah Cyrus Productions, he saw the Bible verses inscribed on the back. He wasn't interested at first, but would later reach out to them when he realized that his bandmates were still not getting serious enough about the music. He slowly got to know David by jamming together, and they would even have beers at study sessions. If you did a double take here, so did I. 
It seems as though, although David preached a strict no tolerance for alcohol to his followers, he would go out and drink. But as we know, cult leaders do not always practice what they preach. After some back and forth on Thibodeau's side, he eventually joined the group at the compound around 1990. In his book, Waco, A Survivor's Story, he describes how his joining the group was very gradual. At first, when he connected with David, it was all about the music. He also confessed, if David had told him outright what he was going to have to do and give up, he most likely would never have joined. David Jewell, ex-husband of Sherry Jewell and father of Kerry Jewell, received a phone call from Mark Bro that David was grooming Kerry to become one of his wives. She was only 10 years old at the time. Kerry went to visit her dad, who at the time was living in Michigan, just after Christmas in 1991, and he was granted emergency custody over his daughter. You see, she had then told him what had happened to her at the compound. Just a warning, this next section contains descriptions of sexual exploitation of minor girls and may be very triggering. Please feel free to skip ahead a few minutes if this may trigger you in any way. When young girls on the compound would reach puberty, they would receive a small silver-colored plastic star of David to wear. This was a symbol that they were ready to become a part of the house of David and could bear the prophet's children. The thing is, some of the girls that received the star hadn't even reached puberty yet. Some were even between 10 and 11 years old. Kiri explained in an interview how her mother had told her that she would soon become one of David's wives. She went on to explain that she didn't really know what a wife was and was even a little uncomfortable around David, but also said, quote, But I was also pleased that he picked me to be his wife. It made me feel special. End quote. The first time Kiri was alone with David was when she was around seven years old and he took her on a motorcycle trip. If you recall my interview with Luke Lombracht a few weeks ago, you may remember that this is part of a cult leader and also a pedophile's grooming technique where they make the victim feel very special. Towards the end of March 1991, when they were celebrating Passover, David booked a motel for Sherry, Lisa and Kerry. Kerry's mother and Lisa had gone out shopping and she had gone for a shower. While she was brushing her hair, David told her to come and sit with him on the bed. She felt slightly uncomfortable as she was only dressed in a t-shirt and panties. In her written statement to a committee which was set up in 1995 to investigate the tragedy, she describes what happened to her. Just another warning, this is pretty graphic. Part of a statement was, quote, He kissed me. I just sat there. But then he laid me down. He took his penis and rubbed it on the outside of my vagina while he was still kissing me. I had known this would happen some time, so I just laid there and stared at the ceiling. I didn't know how to kiss him back. Anyway, I was kind of freaked out. When he was finished, he told me to go take a shower. I walked to the bathroom with my panties down around my ankles. In the bathroom, I realized it was all wet and gooey on my legs. That freaked me out more. I stayed in the shower for maybe an hour. When I came out, David was dressed in his jeans and the bed was made. End quote. Other ex-followers had also come forward with allegations of David sleeping with underage girls, even those that weren't his spiritual wives. An example of this was when an ex-follower was working late one evening in the office near the stairs that led to David's room. He saw a girl, no older than 13, sneak in late at night to go to David's room. She only emerged early the next morning, walking out quietly and returning to the home where she lived with her parents. But it wasn't just sexual abuse that the children were exposed to. Kerry also went on to explain how even as children, they were taught that they needed to be ready to die for their religion. In an interview she stated, quote, I was taught to put a gun in my mouth and also how to kill myself with cyanide. End quote. These allegations, along with Mark Bro's warnings, finally brought the group onto the radar of law enforcement. One of these was the Department of Health and Human Services, 
which, according to their website, hhs.gov, states, quote, The mission of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, is to enhance the health and well-being of all Americans by providing for effective health and human services and by fostering sound, sustained advances in the sciences underlying medicine, public health, and social services, end quote. So they are similar to the Department of Social Development here in South Africa. The HHS embarked on a six-month-long investigation into child abuse allegations at Mount Carmel. They appointed three officials from the HHS, including a lady named Joyce Sparks, who brought in local law enforcement to assist them. They went to the compound on the 29th of February 1992. Joyce stated that when they arrived there, they met Rachel, and she was very hesitant to let them in or even speak to them. You see, David had given strict instructions that she and the other wives were not to speak to anyone on the outside or let them onto the compound without him being there. Rachel eventually gave in and let them onto the grounds. As they were walking around, Joy encountered a little boy. When she spoke to him, he told her how he couldn't wait to become a man so that he too could have a long gun like the other men. This concerned her a little, as Rachel didn't divulge much information and none of the allegations could be substantiated at that time, they left, but the investigation didn't stop there. When David got wind of this, he consulted his inner circle, one of whom was Douglas Wayne Martin, who, as you recall from part three, was a lawyer. David was concerned that the outsiders just wouldn't understand their message, especially the fact that he had all of these wives. Remember, polygamy is outlawed in the state of Texas. In order to circumvent the issue, they came up with a plan to legally marry his wives to other male members of the group, and then they would claim the children as their own. One of these pairings were Thibodeau and Michelle. Thibodeau happily agreed to the union, as he had also grown close with little Serenity Jones, the daughter of Michelle and David. Now before you get worried, I sure was, it's not that kind of closeness. Thibodeau took her on like a dad or an uncle would take care of her. The thing is, even though these men were legally married to these girls, they remained David's spiritual wives and they weren't allowed any physical contact with them whatsoever. Martin King, a reporter with the Australian investigative program A Current Affair on Channel 9, had quite a few conversations with Mark Bro on the dangers of Koresh and his followers. Martin had reached out to David, and surprisingly, David agreed to an interview. Martin and his crew flew out to the US and met David at the Hilton in Waco, as David had said, quote, Meet me at the Hilton at 8pm, and prove to me you are worthy to do my story, end quote. After much talking, mostly from David's side, he finally allowed the crew to go to his compound the next morning at 10am. Everyone at the compound put their best foot forward during the two days that the crew was there. They had even been provided of cases with Foster's Lager cans, which is an Australian beer. Even though the crew had, and I say this loosely, free access to the compound and the followers, they were always on alert. One of the security guards even warned them by stating, quote, You'll never leave here alive. You know that, don't you? End quote. As expected, David denied all of the allegations put forward to him, including the allegations of not only sleeping with the woman, but also of the little girls at the compound. The news crew found the whole experience very staged. Both parties had their own agenda. David wanted to show that there was nothing untoward at Mount Carmel and wanted to get his message out, while Martin wanted to expose him as a dangerous cult leader. Obviously, when the program aired in Australia, it wasn't very favourable to the group, and this news outraged David. This event bolstered him even more as he used this to prove to his followers that the end was indeed near. He told them that the law was out to get them, and that this was the enemy getting closer to destroying them. Things became even more stringent at the compound, if that was even possible. 
David Jewell had described in an interview with ABC, quote, He had absolute authority over the air they breathed, over literally the food they ate, every day, end quote. On the 6th of April 1992, the HHS delegation, including Joyce, returned to the compound for another inspection. This time, David was there. Joyce immediately asked David where the guns were kept, as this was the question that most bothered her. David told her that there weren't many guns there, but that the location was secret and he needed about half an hour to clear the building in order to show her because he still wanted to keep it secret from those on the compound. He continued to show her around the compound, and when she spotted a trap door, she asked about it. He agreed to show her what was behind it. It led to the school bus that was buried underground. In it, she saw an old fridge that was riddled with bullet holes and three long guns. When she asked him about it, he stated that it was where he would do some of his target practice in an effort to not disrupt his neighbours. Each time Joyce tried to bring up the guns, he would change the subject. She also wanted to interview the children again, but got very limited access to them. He would cite Psalm 45 to her, which he stated was a very important psalm to him. This psalm is a royal wedding song. I will not recite the entire psalm to you, but there are two verses that stood out to me in the context of this cult. Verses 10 and 11 state, Bride of the King, listen to what I say. Forget your people and your relatives. Your beauty will make the king desire you. He is your master, so you must obey him. After Joyce left the compound, she went to her superiors. She told them that she had this unshakable feeling that something was just not right, but she couldn't find any evidence to prove it. Her superiors, in turn, had told her that she needed more proof. Even a person who would testify to the goings-on there, but no one would, not even Kiri Jewell, as she was still very afraid not only of David, but also of the fact that he might be right and that she may end up in hell. I can understand that. In my opinion, if you had been told from a very young age that if you went against the Messiah you would end up in hell, that belief wouldn't go away overnight, even if you do manage to leave the group. Joyce did have some further contact with David, and at a deposition she recalled a time where, quote, he said that the enemy would surround the camp, and he talked a lot about Babylon and the government being the beast, and one of the things that they were supposed to do was try to confuse the enemy. So even when he lied to people, he thought that this was what he was supposed to do. His plan was there would be blood and fire at the end, and everyone would die. The saints would all die. End quote. People in the surrounding area became a bit wary of this group. Some even started comparing them to the People's Temple. I will cover this group in a future episode. When David was confronted with the allegations of planned suicide for his group, he would feverishly deny it and say that this was never part of any of his plans. In the US, within the Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment allows for the right to keep and bear arms in the United States. However, they are governed by both federal and state laws. Under two acts, namely the National Firearms Act of June 1934 and the Gun Control Act of 1968, some firearms had become very strictly regulated and could not be owned by any regular citizen. These are machine guns, short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, suppressors, or as we know them, silencers, destructive devices such as hand grenades and bombs, and any other weapon-like devices that can be concealed on a person and from which a shot can be discharged. They are also not allowed to manufacture these weapons, and they are not allowed to modify weapons to make them automatic. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives is according to ATF.gov, quote, ATF is a law enforcement agency in the United States Department of Justice that protects our communities from violent criminals, criminal organizations, the illegal use and trafficking of firearms, the illegal use and storage of explosive, 
acts of arson and bombings, acts of terrorism, and the illegal diversion of alcohol and tobacco products. We partner with communities, industries, law enforcement, and public safety agencies to safeguard the public we serve through information sharing, training, research, and the use of technology. End quote. They govern and uphold any laws pertaining to firearms and the like. Originally, the ATF fell under the Department of Treasury and was an arm of the department who pursued unpaid taxes from persons and companies that dealt in alcohol, tobacco and firearms, but they would later expand and grow into the agency that is known today under the Department of Justice. Earlier in 1992, the owner of one of the neighbouring farms to Mount Carmel had reported to the Sheriff's Department that he had heard machine gun fire coming from the direction of the compound. He said that he had heard this through January and February of that year. The authorities did not immediately act on this. There was also speculation that the local law enforcement had a very close relationship with David and his followers. So, in my opinion, they may not have wanted to do anything. Some even alleged that they would tip off the group if they were going to be visited by authorities. As we have learnt, some cult leaders do befriend their local authorities to ensure that they don't look too deeply into their workings. We saw this with Seven Angel Ministries and MRTCG. In May of 1992, Larry Gilbreth, an employee of UPS, was delivering a package to Magbag Farm on a road outside of Waco when he saw something suspicious looking in a box that had been damaged. He claimed that he saw hand grenades and black gunpowder. This worried him, as he had been making numerous COD deliveries to that address since April that year. He decided to alert the sheriff's office and was put in contact with Lieutenant Gene Barber. Lieutenant Barber had an extensive training in explosives classification, identification and the rendering safe of explosive devices. He, in turn, contacted the ATF in Austin, Texas, and thus they got in touch with Special Agent Davy Aguilera. Special Agent Aguilera had been with the Bureau for around five years at that time and was well versed within the federal laws around firearms and explosives. The two law enforcement officials met on 4 June 1992, where Lieutenant Barber updated Special Agent Aguilera on all the details of the group its leader, and the deliveries up to that point. He also explained that the UPS delivery employee had stated that he had made numerous deliveries to that address over the years, but had only become suspicious of late. After the meeting, Special Agent Aguilera was contacted by Lieutenant Barber once again on the 9th of June, stating that a delivery of goods, which would be used to create explosives, and also modify weapons, was delivered to that same address. The ATF opened an investigation into the allegations and the group. They also received aerial photographs of the compound, which was taken by the Sheriff's Department, and they were informed of the neighbors' claims of hearing machine gun fire from the direction of the compound. Special Agent Aguilera then went on to interview people and companies who had shipped firearm components to Magbag, and found that they had received thousands of dollars worth of firearm parts. He also searched numerous databases to check if they held any licensing permits for any of the goods that were allegedly delivered to them, but he could not find any. According to his affidavit, he claimed that he found that the following had been shipped to the address in question during 1992. 104 AR-15 M16 Upper receiver groups with barrels, 8,100 rounds of 9mm and .223 caliber ammunition for AR 15 M16s, 20, 100 round capacity drum magazines for AK 47 rifles, 216 M15 AR 15 magazines, 30 M14 magazines, 2 M16 easy kits. 2 M16 car kits, 1 M76 grenade launcher, 200 M31 practice rifle grenades, 4 M16 part set kits A, 
two flare launchers, two cases, approximately 50 inert practice hand grenades, 40 to 50 pounds, which is about 22 kilograms of black gunpowder, 30 pounds or 13 kilograms of potassium nitrate, 5 pounds or 2.2 kilograms of magnesium metal powder, 1 pound or 450 grams of ignitocord, a Class C explosive, 91 AR-15 lower receiver units, 26 various calibers and brands of handguns and long guns, 90 pounds or 40 kilograms of aluminium metal powder, and 30 to 40 cardboard tubes. It was estimated that the total for all of this was set at around $44,300, which would be around $86,000 today, which is around 1.2 million rand. The ATF also sent a surveillance team on 10 January 1993, who posed as students and occupied the house across the street from the compound. David had sent a welcoming committee over to their new neighbours. They even brought them pizza and beer but they became suspicious when the person who answered the door didn't want to let them inside. One of these agents was Special Agent Robert Rodriguez. Robert Rodriguez, who posed as Robert Gonzalez and would visit the compound on numerous occasions and also get to know David. David told Robert that he suspected him of being law enforcement, but said that he would still like to teach him. I suspect that David was attempting to either convert Robert or to get him on his side as he had allegedly done with other local law enforcement. Douglas went ahead and ran their license plates and discovered that they were all registered to the ATF in Houston. Even though his followers cautioned David against these guys, he was still convinced that he could get through to them. Robert even brought illegal firearms onto the compound in order to get a reaction out of David, or to get him to open up about the alleged illegal firearms on his compound. But David would tell Robert that they were illegal and that he should get rid of them. With all of this time spent visiting the compound, Robert could never find any evidence of the alleged stockpile. Others who survived would state that there was never a stockpile to begin with. They merely carried stock of firearms to sell at gun shows to bring income into the compound. The thing is, David didn't share every detail with everyone, so I suspect there may have been illegal firearms, but that this was a very tightly kept secret and very few knew about it. Robert had reported back to his superiors that he could not find any evidence on the compound, but this did not deter them. In our next episode, We will look at a warren gone wrong and the eventual end of the House of David. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way in improving our podcast and helping others find it. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that I sent you. I just want to send a shout out to my listeners in the UK. Thank you for your support. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.